Welcome to the Big Swing Podcast, the home of inspiring behind-the-scenes business stories from the world's leading content creators. My name's Sam Barcroft, and I started my media company back in 2003 from my bedroom in Tottenham. After 16 years, I sold it, and I've settled down into my happy ever after, helping out other entrepreneurs to scale their businesses. So I'm tracking down the most inspiring media pioneers, the best in the business, and I've founded Creativeville to share their insights with you. So please subscribe to my newsletter at creativeville.co and join me here on the Big Swing podcast as each week I ask a super producer to reveal the three most important decisions they've made in their quest for success. And stick around at the end when I'll let you in on my personal top takeaway from today's very special guest. Today, I'm chatting with Paul Harris, who is, I'll confess, a bit of a hero of mine. I first came across Paul when I was working on the picture desk of the Sunday People newspaper back in the mid-1990s. Paul had founded Online USA, one of the world's very first digital photo agencies, which went on to set the template for how all photo agencies work today. I vividly remember logging into Online USA's bulletin board service and downloading remarkable at-home photo shoots with some of Hollywood's most famous stars. And that's because in the 1980s, Paul established himself as the go-to portrait photographer for Hollywood's A-list and beyond. Hunter S. Thompson, Richard Nixon, Muhammad Ali, Carrie Fisher and the Williams sisters. That's just a sample of the long list of icons Paul photographed. And his story is all the more remarkable for where it started out. Paul left school at just 16 and joined, almost by accident, the only photographic company in his little seaside town in the west of England. It was the 1960s, Paul was being paid just £6 a week. And because it was a small family firm, Paul realised that his prospects for career advancement were pretty limited. So, when a charming photojournalist called Tony Freeman offered Paul the chance to set up as a competitor, Paul leapt at the opportunity and Waverly Photographic was born. I did some of his occasional press stories like going to soccer matches, but mainly I did ships being built, weddings. I always did so many weddings that I thought if the vicar killed over and died, I could probably take over the service and complete the service. (laughs) How did that pan out for you? We became probably the biggest photographers in the town. Uh, Tony was a charismatic character and the town loved him. uh, And he loved the town and enjoyed being so well known in the town. I had other desires and wishes. Time in Newsweek, I would read those papers and see the pictures of foreign wars and other stuff going on globally. And amazingly, we actually got a couple of jobs. The travel agency Clarkson's had just started and they needed a photographer to go to Greece, France, Spain to photograph their holiday locations. When Tony and I split, I'd go for a week, shoot slides and transparencies, come back, edit. He'd go for a week to another country. I was sent by Qantas to uh, Australia to do the first flight via Kolkata to Perth. And it was looking good. But as time went by, it was obvious Tony didn't want that. And I would remain taking pictures of weddings and ships being built at the local dockyard. And that was going to be my life. So you'd had a taste of kind of jet set uh, reportage uh, yes. Buzzing around I, all these great places. I'd gone to Australia in the 747. I'd flown to all those other countries. I'd been in little boats. It, it, it was all pretty good. So despite all the good stuff, Paul found himself in business with a partner who had different goals from him. It's a really common problem that can consume the attention of entrepreneurs to the detriment of the business. But Paul's solution was not only to leave the business, but to leave the country and head off to South Africa for a life of photographic adventure. I decided I had to go. And I also knew uh, Tony would be very upset if I went and I would definitely be leaving the company in a bit of a hole, Um, except we did have another photographer. We did have staff who did the editing. But the problem with England and its class structure and also the areas. I lived in Barnstable, North Devon, a farming community. 
and London was 200 miles away and full of cool people. And those people, if they ever did come to North Devon, were slightly insulting on uh, local people with their accents. And if we went to London, it was as bad. And I didn't think I would survive in London. It was also 1974, 75, things were going a bit tits up in England, uh, Johnny Rotten, the Sex Pistols, problems in the streets. And I started to look for other places to go globally. And the one place that became apparent was South Africa. I'm kind of trying to figure this out because you had this sweet gig in Barnstable. You're getting flown around the world to shoot these beautiful locations. You're a young man, footloose, fancy free. And you're now thinking of throwing all of that in to head off to South Africa, which is in a time of crisis. Um, There's a war going on just over the border. That's quite a big swing. What was everybody around you saying when you were thinking that through? Well, I wasn't exactly talking to them about it. I, okay. um, <laughs> it was all in my own head, but I knew some local businessmen in the town, some that Tony was connected with. And I learned once again, I was slightly down the pole when it comes to the importance and where my career was going. I enjoyed traveling Uh, and taking those sort of pictures and that wasn't going to happen how my life was going. Why didn't you talk to anybody about it? Well it just was a tricky subject because people who saw me thought life was great. Uh, I had an MGB GT sports car, I would drive around in those days, you could drink and drive. Life really was good but it was not what I wanted. You must have been weighing it up. What do you think tip the balance. Yeah. Well, well I, I always kind of realized or, or thought you don't want to spend your life regretting what you didn't do. And if you took the risk and went and you screwed up, you could always go back to what you were as long as what you were was reasonably successful. And so you decided to take the big swing to go to South Africa. How did that pan out? I told Tony I was going on a two week holiday. And I drove the car to Southampton about two days before the ship left. They loaded it. I jumped on it. I crossed the equator and we arrived in Cape Town. Hold on a minute. Let me just back you up there. That must have felt super risky because you just told your boss you're going for a fortnight's holiday to South Africa. I mean, the ship journey must have taken a fortnight probably to get you down there, didn't it? Yeah, I'd missed out one point that during my research, I found SATV, South African Television, which had started in 1975, which was the year it was. And they said they had opened six bureaus in uh, South Africa, like Cape Town, Johannesburg, Durban, wherever. Mm -hmm. But they're opening a seventh in Port Elizabeth in January and they needed a news cameraman. And right. I had done a bit of that with the Bolex. And they said, if you get here, the job's yours. Because a lot of talented South Africans were leaving South Africa to try and find safety in other countries with their families. <laughs> uh, Everyone else is running away from the, sh- the fire. And, so uh, I and you're I'd running come straight into it. towards it. And exactly. you must have been terrified, Paul. Did that not feel like a huge risk to jack in a kind of beautiful bucolic life in North yeah. Devon and and head off to uh, an absolute um, car crash in waiting? Uh, no, it felt like a fantastic adventure. And I thought I could always get myself out of any shit I dropped into. And how did you break it to everybody that you were off? I, I did actually tell my parents and my father said I was mad. And my mother actually supported me. My grandmother did not support me for the next year. Every Sunday when I go to lunch with my grandmother, normally uh, she always laid a place for me at the table, but I never turned up. Oh, uh, poor love. <laughs> Can you imagine the star boy um, uh, disappeared and granny yes. didn't have anybody to dote on? Yeah. How, how sad. So when I got there, that's when I told Tony what was happening. Uh, He wasn't very happy, but I just felt we could sort that out in that we both own the company 50-50. And my story was I was going to increase the global presence of Waverly Photographic. That wasn't really what I was going to (laughs) do, but that was my bullshit. He must have Um, gone absolutely crackers when he heard that Waverly was opening a bureau in Africa. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, guess what's happened today at work, love? Yeah, I think he knew something was up. Uh, as with all partnerships, not everything is perfect. Yeah, I just felt that in Barnstable, it is a very incestuous little town and everyone had um, done something to everyone. You know, Friday nights was the night where all the men went down to pub. Yeah, fair enough. Th- yeah. Things would happen. So I couldn't see me having a stable, good family relationship in that town. But I didn't really know what was wrong. I just felt I wanted to leave. Inevitably, the job with the South African television station fell through and Paul suddenly found himself far from home with his life savings, £3,000, fast running out. He knew that adventure didn't come without risk and he took the only job on offer and headed off to what was then called Rhodesia. And the only small problem was the country was at war, but they offered me first class travel to Rhodesia and I said well what if I drove they said well we'll pay you the same money as it does to fly so there's money and we'll put you up at a hotel called the Tarascan, uh for a month all expenses paid and uh, they really so, couldn't get anyone to do that job could they Paul? I think that honest. was the deal yes they, <laughs> he but, never said I was the ninth one who'd been offered it but um, no no but, but you yeah. might have been yeah but I suppose Rhodesia as was now is obviously Zimbabwe and um it must have been an odd one for you because in a way this is why you'd left Barnstable right a big editorial assignment in a really important part of the world money respect kudos wasn't yeah. that why you'd gone off on your adventure in the first place i didn't really realize how important it was until i got there because the vietnam war had ended in 1975 and all the top vietnam photographers and journalists were looking for the next war and disturbance and they all came to salisbury Rhodesia. and and it is very seductive being a photojournalist during a war but by me first i had to get to the newspaper meet the other people hear what their daily work was hear who did the assignments and it got slightly worse that the moment i arrived at the office and met jim tampin he said thank god you're here i'm leaving me paul realized that nothing goes to plan in a war zone the rules he'd been used to now no longer applied He couldn't be sure that soldiers would respect his press card. Other photojournalists were blurring the lines between being an observer and a participant. And it wasn't long before Paul was kicked out of the country for his even-handed coverage. He decided it wasn't the sort of adventure he was best suited to. Covering war is really, it, it affects you mentally. And if you're assigned to places your assignment can be two, three, four months. Right. If you have a family, you're leaving your family alone. In a war, things are exciting, but there is a mental consequence to seeing horror. Yeah, um, I, bet. I saw dead people, dead families, children. I'd photograph them. It's difficult to process, but you think you're doing it to inform the world of what's happening. But part of it is... is It is exciting, but it is, when you think about it, very numbing mentally, yes. And how did you cope with it? I left and went to Hollywood. Paul had met the award-winning photojournalist Terry Fincher, who'd made his name covering the Suez crisis before surviving five tours of Vietnam. Terry managed the sales of a worldwide network of amazing photographers, and he needed someone to go to Los Angeles to cover the growing market for celebrity pictures. Paul had found his new business partner. I was a freelance photographer who owned my copyright and he would sell the pictures and I'd get, I can't remember if it was 50 or 60% of all picture sales. But those sales would take three months to, uh, for me to receive the money by the time I'd sent them because you could use the Associated Press to send them analog and it would take 16 minutes and cost the newspaper 300 pounds. Right, that's the uh, earliest kind of version of digital photo transmission, right? Yes. So uh, typically you'd go to the airport and you'd actually go to the gate where the passengers were loading and you'd give them a package and yeah. you'd ask it, take the London, you'd give them 20 quid 
and they'd be met the other end. Uh, yeah, I, I remember think... doing that for uh, Per Lindstrand and Richard Branson when they did that um, amazing balloon rec- world record attempt back in the uh, early 90s. And I remember being summoned to Heathrow to go and literally take the <laughs> film out of the hand of this big adventurer to run it back to the uh, darkroom faster than anyone else. And then in came the, the, the money from Terry, who was very, very honest and straightforward in, in what he did. And I would find stories to do by reading the Los Angeles Times. But I, I also um, did celebrity stories, roller skating with Jamie Lee Curtis and um, Robin Williams. This must have been late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I, I got there in 77. By the end of 77, I realized I loved America. I loved California. I loved everything about it. You could actually get things done. You could achieve things. But I didn't exactly find it extremely pleasant to speak to Americans because, as Sir Winston Churchill said, you are two countries separated by a common language. When you speak to an American, especially if you try English humor, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And if you're in Hollywood, uh, everyone is on everyone else to further their own career. And if they can suck something out of you for their benefit, they will do it you in the end feel not worthless, but just abused. You feel that no one you're meeting actually has a desire to be your friend. They just like what you could possibly do for them. Paul's initiative, his knack for finding a story and his charm soon meant that work was flooding in. And one job in particular would change his life more than any other. One of the assignments I got was from a technical magazine called Information Week. And starting in about 1990, 91, uh, they would do two large conferences a year in exotic places like Hawaii. And they would invite all the top uh, technologists of the time, like Larry Ellison uh, of Oracle, uh, Bill Gates, Michael Dell. And they'd also invite professors from MIT and Harvard, and they would give lectures over a three-day period that people paid 3000 a person to attend. So the first lectures I heard, I just thought, God, I can't take this anymore. This is, this is <laughs> Jesus. Um, but suddenly it dawned on me, these were people developing packet technology, um, the digital revolution, computers, and it was going to get enormous with the internet because it was global with its reach. So I listened to all this, And about 92, I did indeed spend $30,000 on a set of kit, not a digital camera, because at the time, the digital Kodak cameras, there were all Mm. kinds of issues. But with high-end scanners and film, you you could get astonishing pictures. And it was still um, English newspapers who were my primary source of revenue. And they were using AP, paying $300. The, the desks were, were, were all proprietary to AP. I knew this was going to change. And I went to see the various picture editors. And um, it just didn't work. No publication wanted to change. Everywhere I went, there was always an old dude of 55 or 60 who was in charge of archive. And down in the bowels of the paper was a young hot tech dude and he knew where the world was going but his bosses did not and also i I talked to photographers about it and all the photographers would think with digital is it's a way to make money mate because i can now go to a soccer match do 10 pictures at kickoff 20 pictures at half time 20 pictures at the end of the match and the paper is going to pay me 500 600 quid Mm. Uh, to deliver those pictures when I'm only getting a £75 for the assignment. They thought that wasn't going to change. It was obvious to me it was going to change. So So just to to wind back on that, Paul, what was happening at that stage with these kind of few global news agencies had their proprietary kit in each of the newspaper offices and the, the amount of money they were spending on all that kit was blocking anyone from changing. And then the photographers were getting incentivized just to use these systems to send photos in. So they it didn't even matter if they were um, getting any pictures used. They were just being paid by volume of uh, transmissions, right? So it must have been pretty negative for you having this kind of big 
understanding that the world was going to change to this kind of ability to send high quality pictures really quickly from anywhere in the world and then finding out that um, nobody wanted it. Yes, there there is this proprietary network and it was actually a guy called Steve Powell who used to own Allsport who kind of changed the world at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics when he did a deal with News International and other papers to supply JPEGs, having scanned them from the games and publications were able to use them the next morning, which kind of stunned everyone else because they were using AP and, and, and shipping their film to get to someone. How was Powell putting high quality pictures on the front page in just two or three hours? Transformational, and- right? It is that... What inspired you to take your next big swing of setting up Online USA? Yes, I would but just, just mention I was friends with Steve and he came and saw my setup. And amazingly, he managed to get his own great setup as well. It's um, <laughs> kind of an uncanny <laughs> coincidence. Must be. Yeah, no, we're still good friends. It, it was amazing. And he had the reach. So then... Uh, having met everyone who never understood what the hell I was talking about, I met a guy called Brad Elterman. Paul's next business partner was the rock star of rock photographers. At 16, Brad sold his first photo of Bob Dylan at a concert and he never looked back, covering the likes of the Sex Pistols, Michael Jackson, ABBA and creating iconic images of a golden age of music. Brad was brilliant at the sales side of the photo business and Paul was a genius on the technical side. And so it was for Paul's next big swing. With Brad by his side, Paul launched the world's first digital celebrity photo agency, Online USA. I wondered what Paul would have done if he'd never met Brad. I don't know what I'd done, quite frankly. I like having partners. Brad was an instant answer. Brad already had the connections, already was known very well by People Magazine, and Inquirer, whatever the publications were. Mm. And he knew the picture editors and he knew how to sell. He knew the pricing. He also had several uh, photographer friends who were happy to put their pictures through this new agency. Right. So it seemed a perfect fit. And it was. And how did and- you seal the deal? Because, you know, obviously, you've come across this guy who's the kind of yin to your yang, you, you're a brilliant photographer, you understand the technology, you know, you've got this great link up with Fleet Street, which at that time was probably the kind of most lucrative initial market for entertainment photography. He's got the panache, the sales, the international distribution network. Was it all some kind of big thought through exercise and you sat down in lawyers' offices or was it a bit more organic than that? (laughs) No, we did sign legal agreements, but really we just spoke. Uh, Initially, we both worked from our homes and we'd visit each other and we decided how we were going to grow quite deliberately didn't become a paparazzi agency we wouldn't never call ourselves paps we were celebrity photographers who went to events would photograph celebrities when we see them but we wouldn't be hiding behind bushes trying to trap people that oddly enough when it came to selling the company to getty was the important issue with getty the last thing mark getty wanted to do was own a pap agency and and support paparazzi photography when i got my first job at uh Uh, Fleet Street newspaper in kind of 95. I remember being lucky enough to sit at the Mac desk every uh, Saturday to do the football and um, I'd have periods of time where I had a moment I'd jump onto the Mac and um, dial up the bulletin board services and I think Online USA was only one of a handful of businesses that actually had a bulletin board service where I could double click on a folder and be into this amazing archive of a lot of your at home celebrity photo shoots. And um, yes, and it was an amazing archive that you'd built up by then, because whilst you were doing all this business, you were also really busy shooting some of Hollywood's greats at home, right? I mean, Brad and I had an arrangement. None of Brad's pictures became part of online he maintained his copyright i maintained my copyright but he didn't want to take pictures anymore at that time he was happy to sell and run other photographers i had no ability of selling i just knew technology but one of the greatest problems we had i knew 
in digital pictures, you had to have metadata and IPTC captioning so that when they arrived, people would have a caption. Right. And the f- very first pictures we did, we actually used to print a caption on the bottom of the digital file. Mm. Uh, but all the photographers we had, getting them to put digital ca- captions onto pictures it was a hard, hard task. They okay. saw no yeah. reason for it to be done, but we were diligent in doing that. And um, 1997 was a tough year. We were doing really, really well. Uh, celebrity photography was doing really, really well. And then Princess Diana died in the tunnel. Yeah. And suddenly celebrity photographers became the pioneers of, of, of the world. Hmm. And I was in some television interviews d- defending it. And I had to explain to people that as long as you've got publications like Murdoch's papers, the most successful going for the lowest common denominator, if they're paying big, big fees for certain aggressive paparazzi pictures, and you could make a hundred thousand a year doing it as a, as a freelance pap photographer, and your only other choice of job is to go work in a supermarket, it's not a surprise that you turn to celebrity photography. But that event kind of uh, broke Brad's morale a bit because he questioned what he was doing. And um, I did as well. Uh, I think we all did. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It must have been tough knowing that it was hard to get people to adopt digital transmission and digital imagery back in the time to actually commit to it with Brad? They didn't, but they did gradually. And the Italian agent, Settimino Settimino Garitano, um, asked me to come and set up his system in Italy. And there's one thing I didn't realize when I arrived in Italy and sat in his computer, the whole bloody thing was in Italian. You were kind of taking out this new digital photo agency model, and you were really kind of helping create a whole network around the world of other businesses that could sell your photos because they were digitally enabled. I might well be making myself sound far grander than I actually was, but these conversations would happen with a lot of owners of agencies about Mm. what they should do to maintain their archive. And some agencies simply wouldn't do it. RIP all the agencies that decided that uh, digital was a (laughs) fad and wasn't going to last. Paul's final big swing was the fruit of his vision and years of hard work with Brad. Steve Powell, who'd famously sent his digital photos around the globe from the Barcelona Olympics, gave Paul the heads up that there might be an opportunity to sell Online USA. They were about to merge all the brands they had acquired into Getty Images. So they had a news division, a sports division, a stock photo division, uh, and they thought they had acquired a celebrity division. But they found out what they acquired was not um, full resolution digital files with IPTC captions. And they were only a few months away from launch. And we had like 50,000 digital pictures all ready to go. And over a couple months, Steve helped me out, uh, presented it to Getty. Getty sent a, a lawyer, an accounts executive, and another person to examine us for a month and go through everything. And they found everything was legally correct that we weren't really a paparazzi business and they would instantly have 50,000 digital pictures in an archive. How was that between you and Brad when you got the tap on the shoulder from Steve Powell saying, oh, Getty might be interested? Well, I told him the price, uh, but the downside to it all, which I thought Brad was not going to like, was that Getty only wanted me. They didn't particularly want Brad, but a deal was, was made and Brad was very happy with the money and that was how the deal happened and I became vice president of of West Coast content for Getty Images and I became about the 300th most important person in a company of 5,000 and for one year I hated it. I found the passion of executives weren't altogether towards their content. It was more about their own ability to rise up within a corporation. And I was still passionate about photography. So I just wasn't liked by my immediate boss. And I deliberately exacerbated that dislike. And 
I got a secret whisper from someone that I was about to be escorted from the company and which delighted me. And uh, it meant they were terminating my contract early. And they're one of the want... few, they were one of the few senior executives in an American corporation to be delighted to find out they're getting <laughs> the boot. Now in his mid fifties, Paul had helped transform an industry. He'd sold his company and escaped the clutches of corporate politics. And before we hear which of his big swings he feels is the one that made all the difference, I want to tell you about next week's special guest. It's me. Well, it's me and one of my business partners from my time at Barcroft Studios, Alex Morris. Yep, I've finally been released from the legal handcuffs that all entrepreneurs sign when they sell their company. And now I can give you all the inside scoop on the decisions we faced when growing the UK's most successful new media production company. I was the CEO and Alex was the chief creative officer. And needless to say, we don't always agree on what were the crucial big swings that contributed to the success of the company. And that's for next week. Now it's time to get back to Paul to find out which big swing he feels is the one that really made all the difference. Was it number one, turning his back on Waverly Photographic and leaving the UK for South Africa? Or number two, partnering up with Terry Fincher to take celebrity photos in Hollywood? Or was it number three, setting up a new business with rock photographer Brad Elterman to distribute photos across the world in a completely new digital format. So out of those moves, you know, which one was the big swing, really? Which one was the one that if you hadn't have done it? It, it has to be the through. initial courage of leaving Barnesville, North Devon and going to South Africa to the complete unknown. Wow. Uh, from, from there, it all fell into place, kind of, but with hiccups along the way. And I did manage to merge each business with my own desire to continue taking pictures. Well, Paul, thank you so much for talking to me today and sharing your big swings. Thank you very much. And that was my conversation with Paul Harris. What a dude. He now lives by the beach in California and has a wonderful life with his family, with his dogs and walks the beach every day. And he can look back, I think, on an incredible career, starting off in rural England and via war photography, turning up in Hollywood to help revolutionize digital photography and the photo industry with his innovation around technology and content. I've learned a lot from Paul over the years, mostly about how to be positive. (laughs) He's always got a cheeky grin on his face, He's always happy to have a chat and he's really enthusiastic about the business and about the opportunities. And I suppose I took a few big lessons from my conversation. He was really brave early in his career. Paul took big risks. He left a cushy job in his town to go to South Africa on the promise of a job that didn't even materialize and then went off to be a war photographer in Rhodesia He wouldn't have done that 20 years later when he had two beautiful children and a wonderful wife. He just wouldn't, I don't think. And so it made sense for Paul to risk everything when all he had to do was stay alive. He didn't really have any other responsibilities in the world. And I'd advise anybody else thinking of going off and taking big risks, starting companies, traveling the world to do it when they're as young as possible because that gives them the most chance of recovering should anything go badly. Um, Not that it likely will, but the earlier you take a risk, the more time you have to course correct later on in life. And you're unlikely to take a risk, a big risk, once you've got a family to consider. Number two, what an interesting story. Paul had figured out that digital photography was going to change the entire industry of the media. And he figured out how to do it with help from others and went to Fleet Street, which at the time was the world's biggest market for entertainment photography, and said to all these big photo editors on Fleet Street, hey guys, I can transmit photos to you within minutes and we can change the world if we do this. And none of them were interested. It must have been such a huge blow when Paul could see that the world was going to change and he felt that he had a march on the opposition. But what Paul did, which was brilliant, was he backed himself. He didn't bottle it and go back tail between his legs to Los Angeles and just carry on sending film on planes he went home and figured out how to build a business that was in advance of its time and that was going to make huge sense to the media world 
within a short period of time. And he didn't get put off for long by those negative bits of feedback from his clients. He did it anyway. And it's an amazing lesson. Back yourself. Back yourself when others don't agree or can't see what it is that you believe in. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're wrong. If you're right, it's going to be incredible. So absolutely, the lesson I take from Paul is to back yourself when other people can't see. Number three, Brad Elterman, absolute legend. But Paul realized pretty quickly when he was starting up his digital photo agency, Online USA, that Brad was the yin to his yang. Brad was the person that would make his business make sense because he was the one that was going to bring all the money in from licensing all the photos. And the lesson I get from that is a good partnership is priceless when you're starting up a business. I was incredibly lucky to have Alex Morris, who's the guest on the next week's episode, be my partner along with Casper Norman. That changed everything for me, having two people around me that were cleverer than me, that had different talents from me and who were absolutely hardworking and positive and supportive about running Barcroft Studios was the best thing that ever happened to me in my career probably and Alex and Casper were absolutely incredible and we couldn't have done it without them and so lesson number three is a good partnership is priceless and Paul taught me that from afar by partnering with clever people that were going to work just as hard and be just as valuable to the business as he was. So thank you Paul for a wonderful conversation for all your support and goodwill and positive vibes over the years. The Big Swing podcast is produced in association with the amazing Spirit Studios. Our executive producer is Fred Casella. Our sound designer is Will Horrocks. And The Big Swing was created by me, Sam Barcroft. (laughs) 